أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الحضور الكرام سعادة الدكتور فيليبيو أهلا وسهلا بكم في مؤسسة عبد الحميد شومان التي أنشأها البنك العربي عام 1978 في الأردن ونحن نستكمل حلقة ثانية من برنامجنا الذي يهدف لاستضافة أبرز الخبرات العالمية والشخصيات الملهمة في مجال التنمية والتطوير وهو برنامج بدأناه مع رئيس الوزراء الماليزي السابق دكتور مهدير محمد العام 2015 في هذا البرنامج نحاول أن يكون الضيوف من بلدان مشابهة في ظروفها للواقع الأردني من حيث الإمكانيات والتحديات كما نراعي أن يكون الضيف صاحب تجربة ممتدة ومؤثرة غيرت واقعا ما وأسست لثقافة جديدة غيرت من أنماط العمل والإنتاج وأسهمت في خلق فرص جديدة أمام أفراد المجتمع نرحب بيننا بالدكتور فيليبيو القادم من سنغافورة الجزيرة الصغيرة التي قفزت في أقل من نصف قرن من بين صفوف دول العالم الثالث إلى دولة عالم أول بفضل خبرات وجهود مواطنين شغوفين مثل ضيفنا لتصبح بعدها المدينة الأكثر عولمة في العالم وليتحسن فيها مؤشر جودة الحياة وليحتل الجواز السنغافوري المركز السادس على مستوى العالم ضيفنا من الأشخاص الذين يفضلون العمل أكثر من الكلام ويقدمون الإنتاجية على التنظير بلا فائدة لذلك فهو لا يرى أي فائدة في أن يمتد أي اجتماع لأكثر من ربع ساعة فالوقت في منظوره ينبغي أن يتم صرفه في ساحة العمل يعرف ضيفنا بأنه المسؤول الحكومي الأكثر نجاحا في سنغافورة وقد ساهم بفعالية في قيادة اقتصاد بلاده نحو الازدهار والتقدم من خلال ترأسه مجلس التنمية الاقتصادية وعلى مدى قرنين عمل على إنعاش قطاع الصناعات التحويلية وتشجيع الخدمات الموجهة نحو التصدير وبناء المؤسسات الصغيرة والمتوسطة ودعم وتطوير المشاريع وتشجيع الشركات الناشئة لعل عمله الأهم كان بوضعه خطة كبيرة بالانتقال ببلده نحو الابتكار فأشرف على إعادة تشكيل المناهج كاملة من مرحلة الطفولة وحتى المرحلة الجامعية موجها إياها نحو استدخال دراسات العلوم التطبيقية وخصوصا في الطب الحيوي والصناعات الدوائية والتكنولوجية في منظوره يتلخص التطوير والتنمية في مسارين لا ينفصلان أبدا وهما التركيز على البحث العلمي وتطوير رأس المال البشري وقد التزم بهذين المسارين طوال حياته العملية فالرجل الذي بدأ حياته موظفا بسيطا في وزارة الدفاع لفت إليه الأنظار بجرأته في اتخاذ القرار ورؤيته الثاقبة للمستقبل ما جعل رؤساءه يقدرون مواهبه وامكانياته بمنحه مزيدا من العمل والمهام والصلاحيات من الصعب ان نتحدث عن مجمل السيره العمليه لضيفنا ولكن يكفي ان نتذكر انه ساهم في اعاده تشكيل سنغافوره لتصبح مهدا للابتكار اكثر ما يميز ضيفنا نزاهته وجراته في اتخاذ القرار وانحيازه المطلق لسله الاهداف الموضوعه ورؤيته بعيدة المدى التي قادته إلى التركيز على الإبداع والابتكار والشباب كروافع للنهضة والتنمية المنشودة في كل موقع شغله كان شغفه يحمله نحو الإنجاز وأن يضع بصمته الخاصة في ذلك الموقع فهو دائما يتحلى بإيمان كبير بأن ما يقوم به صحيح وأنه سيحدث فرقا واضحا في حياة مجتمع الحضور الكريم يطرح الأردن اليوم شعار الاعتماد على الذات للخروج من الأزمات المتلاحقة التي عاشتها المنطقة خلال العقد الأخير والتي أثرت بشكل سلبي على أداء الاقتصاد الأردني وعلى خطة التنمية بمجملها إن تطبيقا جديا لشعار الاعتماد على الذات يمكن أن نستلهمه من نجاح التجربة السنغافورية ومن العمل الدؤوب الذي قاد فيه الدكتور فيليبيو مشاريع طموحة وضعت بلده كعلامة فارقة في الاعتماد على الذات ونجاح التخطيط لمشاريع 
تعد قيمة مضافة للاقتصاد الوطني الحضور الكريم رحبوا معي بالدكتور فيليب يو I have the honor to be here on a 48 hours uh, schedule. I had a good visit to Petra, but today I'm working. So my purpose is to focus. I had two talks. This morning I had a talk on industrial development, economic development, which was a long talk. But for this uh, evening talk, I shortened it to just innovation. So I'll go through and then I'll be glad to take questions and answers. Now, Singapore is a very young nation. This is our economy. We started in 1965 as an independent nation, but we actually started developing from 1970 when the British withdrew. The British withdrew from Singapore in 1970-71, and the greatest difficulty was unemployment. Uh, Singapore has always been a trading nation, 1819 to 1965-69. So from 1970, our greatest urgency was to create jobs. And uh, in that point, we had unemployment of the three double digit. Now, since then, we have progressed. I will explain to you. Uh, so, Singapore has gone through five phases uh, of development. The first phase in the early, late 60s was creating jobs, any job to give our people employment. So, the most important job was labor intensive. By 1970s, we tried to focus on skill. Skills, higher value, uh, more uh, good for our younger people. So it also supported with technical training, vocational training, uh, apprenticeship. So they helped us develop our skill intensive. By the 1980s, uh, when I joined the government in the economic side, my previous job was defense. We focused on capital intensive industry. Since then, we have grown to the 1990s. We focus on uh, technology. So there I focus on uh, industrial clusters of which there were six clusters, electronics, uh, chemical, precision engineering, and biomedical, and two other areas, but mainly uh, four to six. In the 1990s, we tried to develop a cluster. A cluster of industries means a full value chain, from the development to the final product, especially in the uh, component business. Then in the 2000, I took a responsibility to go beyond economic development I took charge of all the research. Uh, it, I created an agency for science technology research and focus on what I call a knowledge-based uh, economy. This is my focus today because knowledge is important to us, innovation. So the most important factor in a knowledge-based economy is human capital. And a knowledge-based economy requires young people, young men and women to train to the highest level. So in 2001, I launched a program to send out 100 young boys and girls overseas for nine years, three years a bachelor, one year of internship, five years a PhD, funding for nine years, basically in the STEM, science, engineering, uh, biomedical, and mathematics. So these are the young people, I send them out. They are selected from the best uh, kids. We have 40,000 babies a year. The top 1% is only 400. From the 400, I select 100 and I send it overseas. And we call them guppies, they are small fish. Someday they become a big fish. So the young man there is a PhD, Stanford and, uh, and uh, Berkeley in chemistry. The pair of twins are uh, uh, MIT PhD in uh, genomics. The young lady there, uh, UK and Stanford in uh, neuroscience. A young uh, Muslim girl there is in uh, medical uh, what called bioengineering. These are our young people. They're selected from the best, brightest kids at high school. They must have perfect scores. Uh, below perfect scores, they are out of the race. Yeah. Then, now, as a young nation, we have only 40,000 babies. So the key is for us how to borrow, how to kidnap uh, talent from our neighbor. So the first girl is a girl from Malaysia, uh, PhD in uh, physics. Uh, Cornell and uh, MIT Physics. The second girl is from Shanghai. Uh, chemical Engineering from Cornell, PhD in Stanford. She focused on uh, uh, energy. 
The third girl is from Hong Kong. She studied in uh, uh, UK in uh, biomedical sciences and a PhD at MIT on bioengineering. The boy from India, Carnegie Mellon, computer science, and then Stanford PhD. For the young men, for example, they are only given three years to do their bachelor. They are exceptional students. They jump into the second grade. The young men, a bachelor's degree, master's degree in computer science, economics minus in three years, GPA 3.97. He's a bright kid. And then goes on to Stanford, he has PhD. His specialty is augmented reality. Every one of these students I personally interview. I know the scores, I know the GPA. I mean, I even know who's your friend. The young girl from Vietnam, we sent her to uh, Illinois to do camera engineering um, and a PhD at MIT. All these young people come to Singapore at age of 13. They do uh, high school. Uh, four years, what we call grade 9, 10, 11, 12, and they are selected in competition with the Singapore students. They are equally uh, same standards. When they reach 2021, at age of 21, before their PhD, they are given a Singapore passport. Now, human capital for knowledge-based economy, especially in the sciences, is a long gestation period. The young lady is from India. She went to Imperial, we sent her to Imperial, she does an MBBS PhD, a medical degree with a PhD, so she become a clinician scientist. The young lady from Vietnam, she went to uh, UCL and a PhD in Oxford. The same batch, uh, 2005, they came to Singapore 2005 to do high school. And after high school, they finish all night, they go to bachelor PhD. They come in at 15 to 18, high school. They do the bachelor here. Yeah. Let's see, sorry. All right, let's see. Uh, our, so, three years of bachelor, that's all they're allowed to. They have to do very well. And then they go on their PhD. After one year break, they get two lab rotations in Singapore. Then they go on to postdoc. So, develop human capital for knowledge base 20 years. So, you must be patient enough. You must be willing to invest in them and not treat the education as expense item. So, this is a human capital. When I took over in 2001, we were stagnating. In fact, majority of the 2001 were not Singaporeans. So I came up with a goal that I want to have 50% of my scientists Singaporean and 50% non-Singaporeans. So we take scientists from everywhere. Today, I would say we have healthy uh, numbers. Uh, we have a fairly sizable quality. Now, to fund these young people, you must put money, you must put capital. So we set a target that we will spend up to uh, here. 2.5% of GDP on research. So the government policy is that we should spend 25 funding, put aside to fund the research because we have spent the money educating the young people. Now, what's the outcome? The outcome of this uh, knowledge-based economy is licensing. Some of the research they have done. Uh, revenue for licensing is not key. The key is to create uh, new startups. Startups is a challenge. Although they are scientists, they are well educated, they may not have management skill. So the challenge for startup is not ideas. How do you set up a business? How do you manage a business? There we need more management skill rather than just scientific skill. There we try to borrow or hire professionals who know to run companies. And patent filing, we pay for the patent filing. Not all patents are usable, but we try to make sure the patents have a chance of commercial viability. These students are now back. The first batch came home in 2012. Remember, I sent out in 2001, 2002. They come back in 2011, 2012. And this, we have given out a total of 500 PhDs, all PhDs. PhDs cover every subject, medicine, science, physics, mathematics. There you are. Now, where are they now? They are back since 2012. Now we are 2018. They have become entrepreneurs on their own, which is a good way to start up. They are big up, support the SMEs. We loan the scientists to startups, new startups, on two years loan to help the companies. And then we have also now contributed to industry. They become a, a consultants, advisors to industry. They now run their own labs. They are boss of their own research labs. They are also in the universities as assistant professors. This young man just emailed me last week. He's now promoted to associate professor. He's quite a young man. 
and he's an engineering. This young lady uh, works closely with uh, bioengineering. Uh, she is now work a lot with UNESCO for women well educated. She went to Cambridge, UK for biochemistry, PhD, MIT. She finished her PhD in less than four years, very fast. And she attached her to a lab in Harvard Medical School back. This young lady, Kwesui, is the brightest kid in physics. She went to Caltech. She went to best schools, Cambridge and Caltech. Now, when these young people come back, where do they come home to? Where is the uh, abroad, a place to stay? So what we have done is to create, uh, basically here, so you see the National Technology University, the second university, the National University of Singapore, the Duke Medical School, the School of Medicine. So we have four uh, facilities, but in terms of physical facilities, there's a biomedical park, and there's a science park, but the most important is One North. One North is Singapore's location on the equator, one degree north of the equator. So that's why I call One North. It's basically a piece of land, which is about 200 hectare, opposite university, so we can, from one station to the other. From there, we built two clusters. This is a biomedical cluster, all basic science, immunology, stem cells, uh, cancer development, all the sciences. What's interesting in this facility is that the government does own the building. We get developers to build a building according to a master plan, the master plan was developed for me by Zaha Hadid, unfortunately she passed away. But each of the buildings is a different architect. She only did a master planning. So what we do is build the facilities. The scientists pay rent to stay in the lab there. The companies also pay rent, so they are co-located. The idea is to help the scientists from the public and private uh, cohabitate. So they can transfer talent over to each other. Should never put public research in a, what I call an igloo by themselves or in a monastery. There were no interaction. Here, the labs do not own the building. They are tenants. Where do my money go? Money goes to salaries and equipment. So our research labs, we pay for salaries and equipment. Buildings, we just pay rent. Future police, well, and the biomedical science equivalent to US called NIH. So what we have to do for the physical sciences, NSF equivalent is the fusion police. There, because I have a subway station below, I go up. And there I have basically for all the physical sciences, uh, basically semiconductor, new materials, data storage, uh, wireless communication, all in the same location. We have about uh, four, half a million square feet, if you square meters. In biomedical, we have uh, 350,000 square meters, 300,000 square feet. Here there are more because they are more compact. Again, every building is different. You do not see the monotony of the same building design. We want every building to have different architect. They compete to do the job. Then the media people want to be near because media is information <coughs> IT. So the television people, the uh, broadcast people relocate next to us, 16 hectare. So you look at bar police, 18, 19 hectare, fission police for physical science, 18, 19, and uh, 16. So together I have less than 60 hectares. So I see another 140 hectares of green land. Now, these young people come back, they are now in the different labs. You will notice 50% of my scientists are women. Same pay, same advantage. In fact, Singapore boys have a disadvantage. They have to serve military service for two years. So the girls go to college earlier. The boys come back, uh, start college later, but they have the same terms and conditions. All the sciences, they all go to the top school. They apply to the schools on their own. I do not inter interfere. They have to apply to the top schools, there's a list. They have to get admitted to at least five top schools. Then they decide where to go. If they are in UK, they must go to US. If they are US, they must go to UK. We spread them out. These are young people now running a lab. Now, these posters are advertisements, newspaper advertisements. When you do this advertisement, their friends, their family, their parents is marketing them. So in a sense, in some countries, they market footballers. We market scientists. Now, once the scientists are home, they research how to encourage them to do startups because we don't want them to stay in a lab just for a lab forever. So my agency, which is Spring, we are responsible for national standards, responsible for productivity, and we are responsible for 
innovation for growth, we fund growth. So we have support mechanisms for startups, we have accelerators. These are companies specializing in guiding the scientists how to start a company. Money is not a problem, the problem is expertise in setting up the company. Then we have grants, given grants, uh, proof of concept and proof of commercialization. Proof of concept, we give them 200,000 US if it's a good project. The panels are independent uh, panels. They are not official. They are scientists from local and overseas. They judge the projects. They give them a fund of 200,000 for the proof of concept. If the proof of concept works within a year, year and a half, they can apply for grants of proof of commercialization. They have to get up to maybe 600,000 US. So if you're a good project and a good support for manager, you can get about nearly uh, 700, 800,000 US, which is a respectable sum. And then the government can take equity, my agency. I can take equity of one third. Now the condition of equity is the equity helps them to raise other equity. But the moment the company wants to go commercial, the moment the company feels they are capable, we withdraw. My purpose is not to make money, but to give them credibility. Because assuming we have put equity there, we must have done homework. So this is the approach I thought we used to. For startups, require not just encouragement, not just manager expertise, but need money. So there, my agency provides capital and value added. Partners, we encourage companies to invest in them, uh, both locally or abroad, more locally, and then they launch the startups. Then in equity, I provide equity up to one third, but I don't interfere. So they take equity, they go to a bank, they go to other companies to raise some money, and this we've been practicing today. So today I would say that we are doing this for the last 10 years, since I took over in 2007. Uh, and these are some of the companies. These are another examples of companies that are funded by this approach of equity, grant, uh, equity and investment. Remember investment is putting money. That's putting a project money. Equity means taking a stake. So we have three employees. One is grants, which is non-refundable. Uh, investment is also non-refundable. Equity, we can withdraw. These are some One of the companies I mentioned this afternoon, Roti Mati. Roti is an Indian bread. As you know, we have those uh, bread. Around. So this young man came out with this uh, machine. He makes the dough, put the dough, it comes out exactly as a roti. So he's now selling it, uh, I guess, in India too. So the key is, my job of my agency in spring is to help the researchers under a star work with the hospitals because a medical area is not just a bench but a bedside, the patient, and then to attract intermediates and companies. So our job is that of an uh, uh, intermediary to bring them all together, hopefully then grow. So now that we have trained the young people, we have given them the lab facilities, we're going to support to do our startups. These are the example of uh, the medical devices the company have, and these are the startups. The hope is that they must be applicable, especially in healthcare, to the hospitals. So the doctors are involved. The, the doctors are interested in the application of the devices. They participate, and they are allowed to go to overseas to market them. Now, the key for startups, they cannot be in the lab. The labs are research facilities. So it's not easy for a young scientist to stay in a lab and do a startup. So we create a new space that they can come out, which is nearby. And we have two locations. One is called One North near my office. One is in the western part of Singapore, where it's closer to. Uh, One North is near National University. Uh, Launch Pad is near Nanyang Technology. So the two universities have facilities that are funded by us. My office is on the 21st floor of this building, uh, designed by Kawako of Japan architect. And there are the buildings, low-cost buildings, very basic buildings, well equipped, they, they pay rent. So there's a panel of a selection panel, they interview the candidates, if they admitted, they pay low rent, they stay there for two, three years and lot. So this is called uh, launch pad. We have eight blocks of building, 56,000 square meters, that's half a million square feet. <coughs> they are 800 startups today. And there are about 53 companies up in there. This is the facility. Inside the facility in the launch pad, you have canteen, food, 
social, and the young students can visit them. So it's not a, uh, camp, a research lab, but it's a place for startups. So the idea is to pack them all together, interact with each other. Now for the Nangang Technology, which is further west, they focus more on environment engineering. So we just has been built, recently just opened, the same idea. The labs are fully equipped. So if you have a biological lab, all the facilities there, they just pay rent. So it make it minimum hassle for the young scientists to come up. They have the research lab in their lab, but they come to the company to do their startups. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeo, for uh, your presentation. It's very enlightening to see how Singapore moved into innovation. Um, I will open the door now for any questions from uh, our audience. Um, so we'll take a few questions, and then uh, Dr. Yeo will answer them, and then we take another batch. So um, if please, whoever has a question, um, please give your name and your question. Fadal? Thank you. My name is Hamza Jaradad. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Yao for his uh, presentation. In fact, I'm an economist and I would like to know a little bit more about the economy of Singapore and how it moved to this high per capita GDP. As we know, you know, Singapore is a very small country, but a small market. Mm, no so market. what's the main driving force of, of this growth in the economy, in the technology, and in per capita GDP? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, should we take a few questions? Okay, please? sure, sure. Okay. Um, Break it down. Okay, I'm okay, I'm uh, Hanan Malkawi. I'm uh, from uh, Royal Scientific Society, Jordan. Uh, in fact, uh, what you really presented, you know, nurturing the young uh, scientists starting from the high school, mm. and you are taking the cream of the cream, the most yes. elite, yeah. right? And probably then also at the university, you're taking care of the curricula itself, how they really are achieving so much in you know from starting from basic research to commercialization and yeah. mm. so i would like really to know this process and the other question what about the other students i mean do you have like catch-up programs for you know other students that maybe if you really give them the chance they might be really innovative sure. also sure. and do you have any students from our region you know, the Middle East, because I could see they are all from around our neighbors. Yes, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Um, you can write your questions here. Okay. Um, Maybe I answer the first two first. You want to answer now? Yeah, okay. 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 So I'll I'll then okay. Then I'll okay. Please go ahead. Uh, the first question is that we have no market. We have only five and a half million people. But we are located in a good location where China, India, the regional market. Even ASEAN alone is 600 million. So what we have done in Singapore is to invite uh, companies, investor companies to come to Singapore to use our facilities. So the government of Singapore, which I explained this morning, was that we put infrastructure, the building, the electricity, water, they just get the key, they open the factory. We can move our factory in 24 hours from San Francisco, transfer the equipment by 747, move it in and run. But this company have 100% ownership. We do not allow people to say you must have a local partner. That's not. Secondly, all exports are tax-free. There is no tax. All equipment for the export is tax-free. In fact, we give them tax holiday for up to 15 years. Why do I give tax holiday? If they don't come, there's no tax. When they come, they create jobs. There's a lot of indirect tax. So indirect tax is more valuable than direct tax. So when you have indirect tax, they pay payroll, they pay uh, employment, they rent facilities, they buy utilities. So indirect tax is a greater impact than direct tax. Now, why are the tax important? Because if a company comes to us, it's a major investment to come all the way to a far place. Why should they bear the burden of to buy equipment, pay tax? And so the Singapore government approach is that we are in the hospitality business. 
It's almost like a hotel. You come in, you do your business, you pay a hard cash, better still, US dollar, and you do your business. And all sales export is tax-free. So they can sell to China, India, they pay no tax. The money accumulates in Singapore. So Singapore becomes a US dollar financial center. See, by encouraging companies to come to Singapore, use the money, we become a banker by default. On, on the sciences, in Singapore, our school system is a very different system from most countries. We started to change in 1979. From grade one to grade six, a young boy and girl has only three subjects. Four subjects. One is mother tongue. That means you are Chinese, Mandarin. You are Indian, you learn Tamil. You are Malay, you learn Malay. The three subjects are science, maths, and English. No history, no geography, no confusion. So for six years, solid science and maths. When they go to secondary school, they add history, geography, literature. Uh, which means for 12 years of their life, science, maths, English is the constant. So our students do very well in schools. In our education system, our examinations are graded by Cambridge. We pay them to grade, we don't do ourselves, so we're impartial. So Singapore students, when they finish our high school, can go to any school in the US or in the UK. Our standard is high. Now, young Singapore students at grade 10 is equivalent to US high school in the US. So our system is high. Now, granted, I give scholarship for science and maths to the top students. But the other students can also catch up. So the students who are not so smart, they can go to polytechnic, which is a three-year program. They do the polytechnic. They do well, the top 10%. After a year, they can go on to universities. So the support for the base of population is still there. But the top 10% give them a role model. That the students who work hard, they set up, they can go anywhere in the world. So that's the answer. That's okay. um, Fatal. Thank you, uh, Nadal. I was just wondering, uh, on your path to build what you have successfully built, did you encounter any governmental obstacles, bureaucracy, corruption, ethical aspects, or legislative aspects? Because without these, uh, I'm sure it would be quite a challenge. Sure. And the other thing, um, in your quest to build an intellectual capital in the country, mm. uh, was there a parallel effort to build an emotional intelligence capital or an ethical capital loyalty towards the country to ensure that they represent uh, Singapore in the best way so that they don't create any negative stories that will deter okay. investment from Singapore. Thank okay. Uh, we take a second one. Yes. Fadal. Thank you very much, Dr. <coughs> Bui. Uh, I would like to ask you to comment on the impact of this journey of Singapore on the distribution of income. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to answer? Okay. Well, uh, in my work, as you know, given the population is being small, there are 40,000 babies, the top 10% is 400. My biggest difficulty was the other agencies, you are stealing all my best people, nothing left behind for us. So I came to a compromise with the government departments. Okay, of my 100 scientists, the majority, maybe two thirds, are Singaporeans. Right? And I offer only PhD all the way. For the 20 to 30 percent, I steal from my neighbor, China, India, Malaysia, India. So that makes the reduction competition for capital, human capital less. Obviously, uh, in developing men, I have to spend money. But the advantage is that in my research funding, my funding is on a five year basis. So once I get my budget, uh, nobody dare to touch my money. So I'm free to operate. So, yes, there are. On, on the, uh, the young people that were select, they come from the top high schools. So the key for me is to encourage the principals, the teachers, that we want the young, best young people. And most of the young people come from low-income families. What I do in my scholarship is that if they come from rich family, I don't give them scholarship. There's no need for me to fund as well. If they are low-income, 
uh, poor but smart. These are the people I value. So if I want to discriminate about income and quality, why should I give scholarship to a son or daughter of a rich man, no matter how smart? So my scholarship priorities, if there are two competitors for one scholarship, the lower income kids get a very advantage. Discrimination against the rich. So new future income is a reality because when we first started, we are equally poor. But today, there is a problem because, as you know, uh, if you come from a good family, your chance of success is better. So the chance for us is how to make sure that the low income are not neglected. So the government find ways and means to give uh, funding to the low income. And one of the things I do, I try to select students, bright students for the low income. And usually bright students for low income are not spoiled. They don't misbehave overseas. They get GPA of 3.97, not 3 P, uh, GPA of 3. In fact, my minimum score for my students, minimum 3.8. In America, 3.8 is very high standard. So the students must work very hard, keep it in standards. If they don't meet the standard after one or two semesters, I can terminate the scholarship. Every semester they submit their results, I go through the results with my scientists. Why are these students studying uh, elementary 01, biology should be 301. So we have scrutinized it. So we in a sense is that it's taxpayers' money. Our response is to make sure they take the study seriously. They are not on a holiday trip. Does that answer you? Yeah. The other question? Uh, only two. Yes. Yeah. Fadal yeah. Wara. Fadal. Hello. Good evening, sir. I am proud to talk in uh, Arabic. Yeah. Uh, have someone to translate? They will translate. Okay. مساء الخير. أنا عمر شيشاني. أمين سر جمعية المخترعين الأردنيين سابقا. بدي أسأل الدكتور على التحديات اللي واجهت وقبل تطبيق البرامج في بداية حياته في بداية ال قبل تطبيق البرامج شو كانت التحديات الموجودة عنده؟ السؤال الثاني أو الشق الثاني من السؤال. المستقبل مستقبل البرامج هاي بعد هسه شو سنغافورة تتأمل إنها تصير لوين بتوصل سنغافورة بعد هيك هذه كمان شغلة ثانية وسؤال شخص شوية شو حقق لشخصك دكتور يوم can you repeat the first question شو هي التحديات Thank you. Thank you. Personally. No, as a the second one. بدي أخذ من ورا. Please, آخر حدا على ال. تفضلي وقفي. Architect engineer Majid Al Nasser. We would like to thank Mr. Abdul Hamid Shoman. Uh, organization for welcoming Dr. Philip. We would like to, the question that we would there. like to ask you, Dr. Philip, I'm here in the back. Here. Over there. She's over there. Yeah. Yes, here. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Notice. Yeah. Um, how we can benefit from your experience as a role model of success story for what had happened in Singapore from the diversity that you have from languages and religions in Jordan? Since now we have the uh, refugees crisis that we have too many refugees in Jordan. How that, now we have big challenge, how we can make this challenge that we have and make it to success story as how you did in Singapore. Thank you. How can we benefit from the diversity that we have with the refugees that are coming to Jordan? Diversity. Yes, in Jordan, because of the refugees that are with oh, us. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. That's not easy. <laughs> That's not easy, yeah. Well, <coughs> let me try to answer the first question and second question. The first question is, uh, yes, uh, when I put up the plan to move to a knowledge-based economy, my explanation in government is very simple. Singapore is no longer a cheap place. Our standard living is high. We cannot depend on activities, economic activities, they are low value added. We cannot just concentrate on producing things. We have to be able to develop, design, make things. 
Therefore, you must pay attention to investing in higher intellectual capital, which is higher education beyond bachelor's degree, you need to PhD. So I have to convince the government to do that. Fortunately for me, uh, my Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and then my second Prime Minister agreed and they allocate. And what I started was to ask for a budget of GDP is maybe I stayed one and a half percent. So years ago, I got up to two and a half percent share of GDP. So therefore means if I push the government for budget, I must be able to make sure I have human talent. So the key is that the government can give me the money because we can afford. The key is the shortage for us is human capital. So therefore, as far as we're concerned, I need to attract young men and women willing to take a long-term study, not a bachelor degree of three or four years, but a PhD. In fact, most of our students have to do three years of bachelor, five years of PhD, and two to three years of postdoc. Twelve years to be a scientist. It's very long, requires a lot of patience. So the challenge is to how to attract young men and women to make the sacrifice of a long-term education and training. One way to solve the problem is that when they're doing their PhD, I pay them salary. Why? Because when they are studying, they have no income. Their classmates who are a bachelor's degree are earning a salary. So I pay them income, what they would get if they were a bachelor's degree. So while they get overseas allowance, the tuition are paid, they have a Singapore salary. The Singapore salary I pay them is 3,500 Singapore dollars. Maybe that's about 3,000 US. They keep their bank account for five years. So for five years, the Singapore salary is kept for them in Singapore in their account. When they come home, they have some seed capital to pay for apartment to do something. So the challenge is to convince young men and women to take the long 20-year time frame to become a scientist. Uh, the future of Singapore is that the Singapore future is that land is, is constrained, but the different constraint is talent. Given a small population, it's hard to find the best and brightest available. So that's why we open our schools to students from our neighbour. They come to Singapore to study. Our standards are high, but we hope that these students will then join our population. So the key limit for Singapore is not money, not land. We can, our buildings can go up to 70 storey, 80 storey. The key is human capital. So as far as I'm concerned, the necessity for Singapore government to borrow talent, to keep that talent, is a key prerequisite for our future. Personally, for myself, my aim to see these young men and women who come into this discipline of knowledge base, take loan and succeed. So I meet with my students periodically. I see that they get married. I attend their weddings. I see their children. So it's a long-term investment in these young people. Now, on refugees, I have no knowledge because if I were in your country, if your refugees are intelligent, well educated, I would like to kidnap them, add to your economy. So the key is that surely among the refugees, there must be talented young men and women that you can absorb into your labour force. In the case of Singapore, my employment, unemployment is very low, it's 2%. In fact, it's uh, what called, uh, fixed unemployment. But in your case, unemployment is high, so the ability to use a refugee human capital is something you have to decide. My name is Mohammed Hamdan and I'm an educator. The mic. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. My name is Mohammed Hamdan and I'm an educator. And uh, the education system is admirable worldwide. And I have no question on that. And what you have presented to us uh, today uh, proves uh, that going for the top cream of the uh, Singapore population is the way for human resource development at its highest level in the best universities all around the world. My question is demographic. Okay. Okay. You said that you have 40,000 babies, babies a year. Out of 5.5 million, this is a rate of growth of about 0.7%, less than 1%. Well, if I subtract the foreign workers, the population is three and a half million. So, so, so it will be 0.5 percent. Yes, less, less half, half of one percent. Yes. Now, this is a demographic issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is of concern. It should be. Sure. Do you have any strategic planning for this in the future? Okay. Because on the other hand, the uh, expectancy of, of life 
is, is growing all sure, over the world. Sure, so sure. in Singapore, Same. it must have really gone up. So sure. on the other side, you will have the elderly people who are growing yeah. uh, and who at one point of stage will not be productive. Yes. So what are you planning for this in the future, sir? Okay. <clears throat> when we started our economic development in the 60s and 70s, we have uh, big families in the old days, five kids, seven kids. So the government started a program in the 1970s to encourage people to have small families. One child, two child, incentives and disincentives. Today we realize that that incentive has backfired because now the young people are getting married later. They are going to education, longer period of education. So the average young girl, lady in Singapore marries about 28. The young boy get married around 32, 33, which means their productive period is quite short. But the government has come with policies that if they uh, are able, if they can afford, we give them subsidies for larger families. The minimum is preferably two, uh, even three. So if you are a scientist or a doctor or a lady person, if you are working, you can hire a domestic help to help your family. The cost of the domestic help, uh, and the cost multiplied by two, deducted from the lady's income. So there are incentives. Secondly, uh, we subsidize the help of uh, child care. So ways and means to encourage. Our uh, aging population is a concern. Today is about maybe 15%. Japan is about 25 to 30. So the key is that today people are living longer, they're healthy. So encourage people to work longer. We should not retire at 55. It's too young. We retire at 65. So the retirement age in Singapore now is 65. In fact, we have taken away a limit, they can work as long as they are healthy. So these are means to two centers. The other way is to import talent. So when cars, uh, professional people come to Singapore, they can become green card, they can become citizens. So the idea is that to supplement our talent population, we must prepare to borrow or steal. For the list, what Hello, Dr. Philip. I'm Samar, and uh, I would like to say that uh, when you concentrated the, at the first of your uh, uh, speech about uh, education and uh, how uh, it's really important to invest in people and in uh, uh, young uh, young people actually. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, it's really important to uh, invest in people and uh, not in uh, other. Uh, other stuff and my question to you uh, one of your uh, popular saying uh, it's really uh, important to uh, break the rule uh, if you have a good intent so uh, tell us one of your experience that when you broke a rule and still you uh, have chosen the right uh, a wise step uh, even uh, taking uh, this uh, this movement Okay, I have a nice cartoon which I gave to Valentino. He said, there are three kinds of people. People will break the rules, people will ignore the rules, and people break the rules. I believe the people ignore the rules are wrong. But the people who break the rules must break the rules for what motive? If the motive is for public good, to get a job done, I don't think it's wrong. You need two kinds of people. People make rules because you need rules to guide. But rules should not be inflexible. So when I do my job, I always look at the rules. Is this a reasonable rule? Can I break the rules for a certain uh, purpose? I don't think it's wrong, so I break it. The most important to have a good boss that understands that you are breaking rules for public good, not for personal gain. So the key is that if a good government, you must always respect the rule breaker and rule maker, but not to have those who ignore the rules. Those are people in the centre are not the best. But you must encourage people that when they break the rules, they break the rules for purpose. Yeah. Um, Good evening, sir. My name is Muhammad Salama. I'm an electrical okay. engineering graduate from Jordan University of Science and Technology. Uh, actually, I have lots of questions, but I will uh, wrap them up in one question. Uh, 
Um, in the in the beginning, you you've spoken about your um, plan mm. about uh, bringing uh, what you call the PhD guppies mm. uh, from all over the world, uh, neighboring countries, sure. and uh, focusing on R and D. Yes. Um, my my question is about how did they come up with the business models? Where did they get the funding? And uh, how did this the, this uh, business model differ to make S Singapore a standout? What was so special about their business models and startups? Well, uh, the funding of PhD education is done by government. For the startups, uh, when a young scientist comes with an idea, uh, my agent Spring provides seed capital, grants, and investment to help them. But the most difficult challenge for a startup for a young scientist is management skill. How to formulate a business plan, how to uh, develop a product or service, how to market it. Those skills are not taught in the universities. Those are not taught in a research lab. So the key job of my agency is to look for uh, professional business managers, experienced uh, uh, executives to come and help them. And I will subsidize their costs. Remember, having a good idea doesn't mean something can be, become a real product or service. So the key is to supplement these young scientists with management skills, with business skills. Yeah, um, the lady over there. Sabiya, okay, okay, okay. Hey, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, shukran uh, lanani samat al an ila hadhi al muhadra shayika. Ismi Sofia. Ashkar ka doktor Filip. Ajabatni fikra al rabt. قدرتك على الربط لأن القدرة على الربط هي القدرة على توليد الابتكار وسؤالي هل ممكن تبني فكرة بحث تلح حديثا بين ألمانيا والأردن ولكنه نجح, نجح في الأردن لم ينجح في ألمانيا لأن الأردن هي عبارة عن بيئة اجتماعية ساعدت في علاج اضطراب طيف التوحد الشفاء منه عبر هذه الدولة العربية النامية كما يعتقدون عالميا ولكنه ساعد على حل هذه المشكلة الأطفال تعالجوا بين ألمانيا في الأردن هل يمكن تبني فكرة هذا البحث الذي كان في إطروحة دراسة الماجستير وساعد أطفال عديدون لنستطيع حل هذه المشكلة لأنها بدأت الآن تنتشر على جميع الطبقات وجميع البيئات وجميع الدول وشكرا أوتيزم <تصفيق> It's a, it's a challenge because, uh, for example, we realize now uh, we are better at detecting autism. So we are now able to detect autism as young as maybe less than two years old. Now, uh, once you detect the autism, there's a range. Uh, the ability is to how to find um, remedial treatment. So autism in terms of treatment is more clinical than basic science. Although the science of autism is that could be a genetic uh, cause of autism, but most of the doctors focus on more on the uh, rehabilitation of autism. There are many, uh, in Singapore, uh, there are government and private funding for autism research, but most of the research is still more academic rather than clinical, because in the clinical area, uh, ability to treat is quite a challenge. In fact, I would say that in the US, there are many uh, what called advocacy groups for autism uh, that try to help uh, the young boy or girl to get through. So autism is a very difficult, it's a more of a... Uh, we believe that autism is partly genetic and the ability is to detect it early but finding ways to treat or to help an autistic child is a challenge. So I don't think it's basically uh, pure uh, medical is really uh, more of a how the family copes with treating the, the young or helping the young boy. If you are interested, I can talk to you separately because it's an area of interest because we find that in the developed countries, uh, in the past, nobody would talk autism, but now realize that it's becoming a more common. Nobody knows why. It could be because of bad, better detecting or maybe there's a phenomenon of, uh, of explaining uh, development of a young child as blaming on autism. So it's an interesting area. 
تفضل history of development, I would say. Thank you. And uh, actually, what you have told us today is very relevant to what we are going through now in Jordan. Mm -hmm. So the process, the key to development, the, the key to growth is to look at those young people yep. and encourage them mm -hmm. to go ahead and not to find a job, but to create a job. Yes. And the issue is the challenge among them, what we hear mm -hmm. in the policy making process, mm -hmm. that there is no access to finance, lack yeah. of financing, mm -hmm. but lots of ideas, mm -hmm. yeah. and we are wasting them. I notice in your graphs mm -hmm. uh, the, the question of enablers. Yes, yes. I claim mm -hmm. that financing is available. And there is no problem of access to finance. But the problem is helping those young people, intellectual, intelligent, yeah. able. And I have seen a lot of young people here tonight sure. who are eager to do business and mm. to create jobs. Yeah. But where they are not really enlightened in the process of how to formulate the project, yeah. how to to access it, how mm. to present it. Yes. And I noticed that in, in your blocks yeah. of work, mm. the question of enablers. Yes, important. And could you elaborate a bit? So, okay. And what, what do you suggest that we should do mm. at this stage? Okay. Thank you. Well, I mentioned that being a bright scientist, having an idea, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's commercially viable. What most young scientists uh, do not have the skill is how to formulate a business plan, how to develop what is a good product or idea to really what does the market want. So you need experienced people to help guide them. What we do in my spring is that we hire people with experience, uh, prefer people with experience in the business executives and bring them to help these young people. And we, ha we pay for these enablers. Because knowledge is one thing, experience is not available when you're young. So these experienced executives provide business advice, business advisory, how to structure your company, how to uh, go to the bank to borrow. Uh, we have in, what we have in spring is that we provide funding through 17 banks. We do not provide uh, loans directly. We go to the banks. Every loan from the bank we guarantee 50%. So the bank at worst lose 50%. But because these banks are approved by us, they process the loan, knowing that in a default, I bear 50%. But the difficulty for the young scientists, somebody must help them draw up the business plan. Someone must draw up the financial plan. And then how to do it. So that is very important. So the enablers are important. So because challenge with us is we are short enablers, so we borrow and bearers, we hire and bearers from abroad. We go to America, UK, whoever is experienced, bring them on contract, one year, two years, three years to help. So that is a job of my agency to find animals to help these young scientists. But the most important in the young startups, you must provide the facilities for them that they don't want to buy. So in those startups that you have, all the equipment are there. If it's a biological lab, the clean lab is there, equipment is there, they just pay to rent. So it's easier for a young man, a young lady, to start a, a startup in a facility where everything is ready. So it's almost like renting a space, renting a lab, uh, renting the equipment. So that asset, is asset facilitation is important. Firing and advice, business advice is important. Now, if you have good advice, if you have good facilities, it's easier to borrow money. 
تفضل رح احاول اخذ اكثر Good evening, Dr. Yo. We highly appreciate your presence in Jordan, as well as we do appreciate your valuable presentation. Sir, we live in an environment in Jordan quite different than that in Singapore. Sure. You don't have troublemaking neighbors as we have here. You don't have people like us who like to bring expatriates to farm our fields and housemates to work in our homes. We have a lot of problems, but we have the enthusiasm and the willingness to be as well as you. Sure. In the past few years, Singapore was always representing a prototype which we must follow. Would you please advise us about a recipe which we may follow wow. here in Jordan for progress. Thank you very much. Well, I am here as my, a guest. My name, by the way, my name is Azmi Zorba. Thank you. Well, I am here on a 48 hours visit uh, and as a guest of the showman. So my knowledge of uh, advising uh, you is impossible. But what I would say that I visited, uh, I met with young people this morning from different universities arranged by showmen. I visit uh, your University of Jordan. I visit uh, uh, Hussein uh, Technology Institute. You are very interested young people, both boy and girls. So the key is that how can government give them support? And you have a sizable population. You have about your own six, seven million people, definitely more than Singapore. Uh, and the young people are quite capable. Today I saw in a lab, because I went through all the projects they presented to me, a uh, short trip, I was quite impressed, they're capable. So you have advantage of human capital. You have more human capital than Singapore, for sure. You don't have to kidnap, you have it here. So the idea is basically, is, uh, you have to formulate your own plans. I guess you're a Minister of uh, Planning, uh, Minister of Industry, Minister of Finance, you have to sit down together. Maybe what they should do is form a working committee of them and the young people rather than a working committee of old people and all old people. The young experienced senior servants sit down with the young people that I met this morning. Maybe they come up with a plan. Yeah. The young are uh, uh, call more willing to take risks and the future belongs to them. Okay. Um, the السلام عليكم نرحب بالدكتور فيليب وبتمنى انه يجاوب على هالسؤال احنا في عندنا معضله بالاردن زي مشكله البيضه من الدجاجه ام الدجاجه من البيضه من يقود في سنغافوره التعليم يقود سوق العمل ام سوق العمل يقود مخرجات التعليم الجامعي وشكرا اوكي اوكي اي اكسبلين اي اكسبلين ذس مورنينج يا ام تشينج I explained this morning that in Singapore, the economic agency works closely with the ministry. So when I was chairman of the Economic Development Board, the two presidents, and also the chairman of science, the two presidents of the two universities served on my board. Why? Because it's my responsibility to create jobs. But I have to create jobs where the skills are available at the university. So the university and us work together. For example, uh, for the pharma industry, Ministry of Manufacturing. I need chemical engineers, I need chemists, I need uh, yeah. expertise. So I sit down with university and say, Look, these are the people I need, this estimate number I need, your job university to train these people. So the responsibility, job to drive education. The most important for any young man or woman is to go to university, come up and get a job. So the responsibility of government not just to educate, but also to place them. So in a sense, in Singapore, the economic uh, role drives education, which is quite unusual in most countries because you see we give them education, they get a job, it's not true. Which means uh, we have very little room for poets, jokingly, very little room for, so we are very much on hardcore technology. 
there is a handicap that we realize so we now try to diversify but the key is that economic mission drives education um, thank you very much and um, a small comment and a question sure uh, the comment is first of all of course is Messi the king from from a long time has been very interested of course in Singapore and has visited several times yeah. and we are very proud that this relationship is now going to be cemented with a new ambassador going to Singapore sure. uh, very very soon so we're very proud of that second of all I'm very proud that you and I and Valentina we are all associated in the same fellowship together yes. Yes. what I'm really interested in was what you started with which is labor mm. because I believe that in Jordan our biggest challenges uh, and should be in any country is when you have high unemployment rates sure, yeah. and this is something as a gentleman said before sure. the regional situation mm. has put a lot of pressure on our economy I would like to ask you for mm. instance you touched upon it in the beginning mm. and there's no single formula mm. how would you suggest that a country can do because technology and startups from every seven startups or eight startups one company makes it yes and how many people they employ isn't very large. It's not labor sure. intensive. Sure. For labor intensive, you have to have a certain yeah. economic environment yes. and certain formula. Yes. I would very much like to hear your opinion about okay. a country when you have high unemployment rates. <coughs> what it is that you can do is so that you can decrease that in a short period of time. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, when we were first independent in the 60s and 70s, our employment was double digit. So the government, as far as the Economic Development Board, which was formed in 1961, to create any labor demanding jobs. No job is too humble so long as uh, the worker can find a job. So which means you should not discriminate. So long they are not polluting, so long they are not wasteful, it's important to create jobs. And in most cases, over time, the jobs are upgraded. So give me an example. In 1990, 1990 the Indonesian government invited me to help them. So what I came up with a plan was that to, for me to help Indonesia, Jakarta is too far. There are islands around near Singapore that belong to Indonesia. An island called Batam. I have it in my this morning slide. So I told the Indonesian government, give me a piece of land, 500 hectares, allow me to bring in labor intensive industry which is clean. So what I did was produce the components in Singapore which was a more capital intensive, more skill intensive, send all the products to assemble in Batam. In less than two years, I created 100,000 jobs. That's it. And I repeated this same formula in 1994, the Vietnamese government, as you know, they are communists, uh, they were our, our enemies. They came to my government and they asked to see me, can I help them? So what I did was to go to Ho Chi Minh, I told them, I want 500 hectares of land, you provide the land, you provide uh, the electricity and roads, I will create a job. So today, now there are about seven industrial parks in Vietnam, of which the Vietnamese own 51%, the Singapore party own 49%. But all the jobs are all local. But again, they start with labor intensive industry. Any industry that is light and clean. Because over time, any nation will upgrade. You will go from labor to skill capital. So you must be patient enough that so long as the industry is clean, uh, there's no reason not to encourage them. So if I were you, if any young company start up with labor intensive, I also prepare to give them tax holiday. Why not? And what I did in Indonesia was say, what I did with the Indonesian government in 1994 was that if I bring these companies to Indonesia, you should not tax them at 35%. They will not come. First and foremost, your market at that time, they were making electronic goods, there's none. So you should allow them to be able to not to pay tax for five to ten years. Secondly, it was in the case of Indonesia, they had a rule that all investments from foreigners, they must have a local partner. I say that, that makes no sense because the local partner has nothing to contribute. Right? So why do you need a local partner? So they made a waiver. So in the case of Batam, even in Vietnam, Local partners are not required. The key is, is not ownership of the company, but who's creating the job. So these are the fundamental, which is quite different from most countries because if you have a market agree, 
But you know, as far as I'm concerned, we focus on export. So in the early days, Singapore exports was uh, TVs, Singapore exports was uh, radios, uh, a very labor intensive industry. Today, we don't make any product, we make components, we make semiconductors, we make chemical ingredients. So we move away from finished because our cost is no longer cheap. So if you start with a humble beginning of labor intensive industry and soak up labor, you will naturally progress. Provided you keep the skill training. Because when you bring in labor industry, they are not selling high skill. But as you progress, you can. So every someone asked me, is it possible to collapse? There are five stages in the shelter. Why not? There's no reason why you cannot collapse from labor to knowledge. Maybe in shorter period, depending on your manpower talent. Does that answer you? Well, not really. <laughs> yeah? Not really, because okay. we have free trade agreements. We have free trade agreements okay. with America, Good. with Singapore, okay. with Europe, yeah. with Turkey, with some Arab countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, our neighbors, we have access to 140 million consumers Good. just between Egypt and Turkey. We have all the incentives that you just mentioned, mm. tax incentives, Good. Uh, free ownership, yeah. repatriation <coughs> funds, capital, capital, correct laws, mm. safety and security. But it's still, you know, and you have these free trade agreements. I mean, we are a huge market. Sure. Um, but still, we still have that labor problem. And, and this is why I asked you that question. I mean, what you mentioned, we have. Mm, okay. But it's still not, uh, not, not pushing. Okay. And I was thought maybe you have a, a magic wand or something. That no. You... Uh, what we did was to create an agency uh, called Economic Development, whose main job is to market, to attract companies. Someone has to go out there and hustle. Someone has to go out there to try to bring companies. See, you cannot, because you have all these free agreements, people will come. So what we do is we are very targeted. I mentioned this morning, oh, of a, of a joke, that as a, I was very keen to attract uh, milk powder to Singapore. Milk powder is very expensive. And milk powder for babies have a lot of minerals. So there are three American companies wanted to go to China because they have their babies, they have the market and everything. But they have no cows, no milk. New Zealand have all the cows, they own the milk. So what I did was to go to a company and say, look, true, China has a big market, but you trust them, you trust their quality. So they came to Singapore today, one of the biggest exporters of milk powder, I have no cows, I have no babies. So, but it requires people like me to do the work. You cannot leave it to agreements, you need people who can hustle. People who can sell uh, ice cream to Eskimos. I need to take more than one question at one sure, time. Sure, sure, yeah? sure. Um, Mali, you wanted to ask a question, and then we'll come back to you later. We'll take more questions. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Uh, my name is Mohideen Tok. I'm an educationist. Yes. I have been to your country three times in oh. the last three decades. And I have seen it develop, and it's now one of the most modern countries in the world. I want to make a little detour, and uh, Western literature says that uh, there is a connection, a clear connection between democracy and development, democracy and modernity. Sure. And they quote many countries, but they make few exceptions. One of those exceptions is Singapore, is probably one of the few countries that are considered non-democratic <laughs> in the Western sense yes. that made it. Mm. Did you feel at any time that this element, this factor, is an impediment? This is one. Yeah. The second thing, I'm concerned about the culture. Work ethics, commitment, yeah. productivity, so on and so forth. When I was in Singapore last time, mm. I saw a very high commitment mm. from small shop owners. Sure restaurants, wherever you go. How did you make it? How did you change the culture itself? Now, the question of our friend Mazin uh, triggered an idea in my mind. Mm. What are we missing in Jordan? We are missing somebody like Dr. Philip Yo. <laughs> we can kidnap him. Who is being brought in nearly three decades ago 
a visionary leader, a clear uh, message and a clear plan and clear objectives for the future, who has a strategy, put it in an action plan, and was empowered to implement it and got the support of the government. Sure. Now, I consider this is one of the most important lessons that we can learn from Singapore. You cannot expect somebody who will come into office and stay for two or three years yeah. to do something like what you, have, what you have done. As you said, when you start with 10-year-old boys, you yeah. need at least 25 years yes, yes. to see them yeah. getting a PhD and sure. so on and so forth. And I have a last comment for our friend who has left the room when he talked about governance and, 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 and corruption. One of the main factors for the development of your country mm. is that you have high ethical yeah. and moral standards mm. and your anti-corruption commission yes. is probably one of the strongest one in the world. Yeah. And your record in fighting corruption is always among the top 10 in the world. And this is another important factor that can be taken into consideration and I hope my friend Mazen will consider that also. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, so my name is Judin Baldin. I'm studying in the King's Academy. Ah. Uh, I'm champion for UNICEF and uh, and uh, ambassador for uh, ambassador for Zen. Okay. I'm um, also I'm the smallest novelist in the airport. So from the third world in 1965 to the first world today to recount the great words that uh, Lee uh, Kuan Yo tell us in his memories, we had no other um, uh, possibilities than success. In front of us, uh, a lot of work, less resources and and so, so little time. The smallest, Taban, um, Singapore, the smallest country in Southeast Asia, is itself the fifth richest country in the world in terms of foreign exchange reserves. I believe this can be reflected, like um, uh, reflected in the country. And so I would like to ask you if you were to choose secret of success between education, industry, and tourism in a portly list, uh, how can you order it to maintain a healthy and balanced country? And do you know, like, there is anything impossible in the world, uh, Singapore can do it, can't do it. Faddal? <laughs> <laughs> um, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله دكتور فيليب يو كيف لفت دكتور فيليب الأنظار له عندما كان موظفا في وزارة الدفاع السؤال الثاني إذا كان دكتور فيليب صاحب قرار في بلد كسوريا تم تدمير بنته التحتية وتهجير شبابه ما هي أهم خطوة للنهوض بهذا البلد بدي أخذ من وراء تفضلي لابسة أبيض وقفي Hello, my name is Noor Sultan. Um, uh, my question is about um, Singapore. I read that it's one of the biggest spenders in military industries. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about the ethical aspects of the military in industry in Singapore? Do you think about it or is it only about uh, creating jobs and uh, technology? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, the valuable time, uh, Dr. Yu. Uh, when Singapore started the uh, educational, economical, and innovation program uh, to build the country, did you went to the um, global financial organization like World Bank and uh, uh, um, IMF? 
And uh, if so, can you please uh, tell us about the, exper the experiment, our Singaporean experiment with these uh, organizations? Uh, also, I want to know how long it takes uh, take Singapore to end the financial programs with the World Bank and the uh, IMF. Thank you. I'll try. Okay. Oh, I'll answer your question first. First and foremost, uh, Singapore did not go to a World Bank, did not go to IMF. What we did was to hire uh, uh, an advisor. And uh, the advisor we had was from Holland, uh, under the UN uh, program, Dr. Wissimius. And he came to Singapore in the 60s to help us to develop uh, economic development incentives and programs. But at the same time, Singapore doesn't borrow money. Uh, we have not borrowed money. Our aim is that we encourage our people to save money. So when Singapore first became independent, we encourage people to, first we create jobs, we force people to save. So if you're a Singapore young man or woman, and you have a salary of $100, $20 of your money is put in a savings account by law that belongs to you. The employer will provide another $15. So $35 of your 115 belongs to you is compulsory saving. With that money, the government of Singapore borrows from the saving to build infrastructure, to build the schools, to build the housing. So Singapore's growth is self-financed. In a sense, because we are self-financed, we are more disciplined. If we can borrow money, uh, get money freely from third parties, we tend to be more uh, wasteful. So in a sense, I mean, my Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was very strict about we should never borrow, uh, we should try to develop our own financial independence. What we did in the 1960s was to do, go to governments and ask government, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, France and Japan, can you give us scholarships? We didn't ask for money, ask for scholarships. So I was of the generation, there were 200 of us sent overseas to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Britain, where the funding of education paid by the host government. But we were required to go home, which means you cannot disappear into those donor countries. So the greatest contribution to Singapore's growth is that the generosity of countries who are willing to give us educational uh, funding. So I would say that play a very important role. So when we came back from Canada, or Australia, New Zealand, we were placed in government and we were young people who ran the government agency. So when I came home in 1924, as a young officer in defense, I started working alone because I was required to work for the government. So in a sense, Singapore has grown with the generosity of a donor government in education. We have benefited from advice from one or two individuals from countries that we respect, like Holland. People were frugal, people were careful with the money. So those value systems were brought to Singapore. Does that answer you? No. The one on military industry. Uh, one of the things we did in 1965 when we became independent, we became independent in 65. The first company we created was the defense industry. The idea of the defense industry helped to create jobs too. So when I was involved in defense industry from 1970, we try to make as many of the defense requirements locally. Today, I would say that in, in our neighborhood, we are the only country that can make a whole range of ammunition. We can make our own tanks. We can make our own warship, except aircraft. Aircraft, we don't have volume. We buy the aircraft, we modify the equipment, we modify the software. So we, we are able to use the defense industry for good. Now, in military procurement, in most countries, the military officer buys equipment. It's very dangerous. In Singapore, what will happen? All military equipment purchases are done by civilians, independent of the military. So the Army, Navy, Army Chief, Navy Chief, Air Force Chief can specify what they want. But the decision of buying equipment, selecting equipment, dealing with suppliers are done by civilians. So it's separation of uh, temptation. Because we are not the user. Because if you are Air Force Chief, you specify what you want, the company will try to encourage you to buy that product. So in a sense, Singapore doesn't suffer the corruption problems of military uh, countries around. Most countries, military officers are involved in buying equipment, so they have a personal benefit. Singapore is very strict. So when I was a young officer in defense, 
My job was to make sure the military officers do not interfere in the procurement process. Our procurement process is very careful, very thorough. The military officers to study this is what I need, and then that's it. So, secondly, because we run a conscript army, uh, there is no room for temptation. Everybody is a, a soldier. We do not encourage professional army because professional armies always have a military coup in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Myanmar. For more experience, it's better to we follow the Swiss border. Every person, every male is a soldier. So therefore, the values of defense is a public responsibility. In Singapore, every boy has to serve a military service. In my time, it was three years. Now it's two years. After two years of military service, they save the reserve for 15 years. If you're an officer, for non officer, they serve 10 years. So we have kept the country stable and peaceful, but separation from professional army to a citizen army. Procurement is done by, done by civilians, never military. Does that answer your question? Yes. Oh. Um, did, uh, are you going to answer any of the questions here or just. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, your questions are very broad, so let me explain. I will say that uh, the, the education role is very important, but at the same time, uh, we have to train the right skills so that young men and women have a job. So the approach to Singapore is that not everybody should go to college, not everybody should go to university. So what we have now is for every 100 young men and women, only 25% go to university, 35% uh, go to polytechnic. And the other difference is vocational. And in a sense, we borrow the German model. Uh, we borrow the English model for university. But so we have a, a population of three and a half million. We have only four universities. And uh, all government. Secondly, all schools in Singapore are public schools. There are no private schools. They are same standards, they are high standards. If you cannot cope with your public school, you must apply to be released to, to a private school. Private schools, you pay expensive, but you don't have the same quality. And teachers are very highly paid. Teachers in Singapore are possibly the highest paid in ASEAN. So you pay your teachers well, you have high standards of public education. There is no reason to have private schools. We have private universities because we want to diversify, so we invite INSEAD to Singapore. Singapore Koran's a business school in Singapore, foreign students. We have a technical university in Munich in Singapore, running bachelors. A masters in engineering. We have a Duke Medical School working also on medical. So in a university level, we have public-private partnership. But at the elementary and secondary, all are public schools. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the back. Um, yes, go ahead. Doctor yeah. uh, Philip, to start with, I thank you for being here. My question, my name is Ghazi. My question is related to ICT, uh, cyberspace in particular. As you are uh, working in the innovation and improving the ranking of uh, Singapore, it's amazing to know that Singapore rated number one in cybersecurity. And you know, the cybersecurity index is based on five pillars. One of them is technology, the other one is uh, R&D. Sure. Then you have the collaboration between inter-agencies. So you cannot be better in technology than the United States or have more money than the United States. With your society being uh, formed from at least three subcultures. So how can you improve the overall engagement of your people in organizations and in all the sectors to have a ranking better than the United States of America. This is actually amazing to be number one while the United States becomes, comes in the second, second place next to you. So my question is, how can you break down the boundaries of these subcultures, the three subcultures you have, to form some kind of a hybrid culture that forget all the barriers within these uh, subcultures and uh, you know, prove to be they are the highest in the world uh, uh, concerning this uh, global uh, security index. Okay. And you know, with the cyber security, it impacts all the sectors, all the verticals, all the services, 
and it's a global problem. Uh, the cost of these cybersecurity attacks is in trillions now. So how could you manage in a small country to be in the first uh, place? Thank you very much. I'll try to answer you. Um, wait, uh, uh, maybe I'll finish the one first. One question. تفضلوا ورا تفضلوا الاثنين رافعين ايديكم جنب بعض تفضلي تفضلي وقفي بس I'm Raneem Saman and I'm a student at Jubilee High School firstly my firstly I would like to appreciate your time here and my question is what does what has uh, Singapore do, uh, done for students that has no talent at uh, science, such as a sport ta talent, uh, a music talent, writing talent? Yeah. Okay. Uh, رامي الزرو بدي أسأل سؤالين لو أتتك دكتور فيليب دعوة من الأردن لتطبيق مشروع سنغافورة في الأردن ما هي أول ثلاث قرارات ستقوم باتخاذها؟ هذا أول سؤال طيب معلش بس نسمع السؤال الثاني في الكلمة التعريفية للوقت الفاضلة قال أنك أكثر اجتماع 15 دقيقة هنا في الأردن 15 ساعة وبعد ذلك يحكم لك إيش؟ من كم من إيش؟ من كم من فوق معلش شو بدنا نصيحة تعطينا إياها لمسؤولينا عشان تفضلي تفضلي أنا سوسان اللي بدي أسأله كثير من الأمور أو المؤسسات بتنجح بسبب شخص واحد لما دكتور فيليب يتقاعد شو اللي راح يصير حتى يكون في هناك استمرارية للعمل الكبير اللي قمت فيه الشيء الآخر كيف تتعامل مع الحكومات المتغيرة لأنه ممكن حكومة تدعمها فحكومة تانية ما تدعمها فكيف تقدر تضمن إنه الشغل اللي كويس اللي عملته يكون فيه له استمرارية شكرا طيب. بدي أخذ آخر سؤال بدي أخذ آخر ما لش أخذت وقتك أنت لو سمحت خلينا ن... تفضل ورا تفضل آخر سؤال يعني تفضل uh, Good evening Good evening um, it's, um, it's amazing what you've done in the past but if you want to look uh, to the future for a minute if you were to repeat the same, ex uh, the same experiment in Singapore, your area of expertise, going into the future in the age of AI, in the age of disruptive technologies, no barrier to knowledge whatsoever. The, the lay of the land has changed a lot. Sure. For aspiring economies as, uh, as ours, looking at Singapore, we cannot, we, can, we cannot aspire to repeat your experience. We have to, ch uh, to do an, our own experience yeah. in a changing environment. Yeah. What would you do if Singapore were to start now? What would you do the same and what would you do differently? Wow. Thank you. The last question. Last question. Okay. Last question. 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 Um, and you are warmly welcomed in Jordan. Uh, my question is that I'm a startup, and um, I already done a research mm. in uh, environmental field. Um, the problem here in Jordan that you have to prove your scientific concept before um, you will be incubated, and you have to get a patent also before you get uh, incubated. Mm. So. Um, what are the fund resources that Singapore used to uh, support the students financially sure. uh, to prove their concepts? And um, for supporting the students, I want to thank um, Dr. Fahed Awad. He is a doctor in my university and uh, excellence uh, uh, 
an excellent center in Jordan University. Um, yeah, he is my doctor. Yeah. Um, he was supporting me. Um, and uh, what is the um, um, standards that the incubated or the startups who are willing to be incubated should have um, to make sure that their concept will be validated and the fund that they will get, um, they will be um, satisfied enough and um, willing to success. Maybe Thank I you. try to... Thank you. This okay. is the last question anyway. Okay, okay. We don't have uh, time. Please go ahead. Okay. Maybe I'll start with your question and work backwards. Uh, I mentioned just now, in the spring, uh, we provide funding for proof of concept. Proof of concept doesn't require a patents because not all products require patents. So the idea is that a young scientist or young innovator who has to submit a proposal to a panel. The panel are appointed by us from experienced people. They will sit down with the young people and see, evaluate. If that proof of concept is approved, the funding is 250,000 Singapore dollars. That's about 200,000 US for up to a year and a half. During that period, that young uh, innovator has to submit reports, review. Now, most of the time, all the plans are wrong. Because when you start work, not everything works. So we provide the funding for that whole grant period for two years and non-refundable. The risk that we will lose the money. If the project succeeds, the next choice is, is it commercially viable? Concept is one thing, but being a commercial idea or that. There, a separate panel will evaluate, see the weather, and that will help to give help to the young innovator, business advice, uh, legal advice, financial advice, how to do it. There will give them funding up to about 750,000 Singapore dollars. That's about US 650. So that funding is very carefully done. That will take proof of concept about a year and a half, proof of commercialization up to two years. So you must be patient. Not all ideas are patentable. If the ideas are patentable, we will support the funding for patent. But most ideas need not be patented. So the key is that uh, in a university, the uh, professor should support the students, help the person in guidance, but we would like to uh, get business advisors to help him or her. Okay. On, uh, can I come back to your question on uh, cyber security? Yes. Uh, cyber security is very important because Singapore is a financial center. The Singapore dollar is a very strong currency. So there are 100, 100 banks in Singapore, international banks located. All transactions are US dollars. Singapore dollar is not used for, we try to keep the Singapore dollar safe because otherwise uh, it will run away inflation for us. So all the dollars are borrowed US dollar. They can borrow yen, they can borrow yuan. So cyber security by our money authority is very important. So the government spends a lot of effort to try to ensure that uh, cyber security is protected. We have a separate agency for cyber security. Uh, if you need any help, I can put you in contact with them. Yeah. The other question was uh, for non-scientists. Now, my portfolio is science engineering. Doesn't mean that everyone has to be a scientist. So we have the School of Arts, School of... Uh, so we have laws, but they are beyond my agency. So not every boy and girl can be a scientist. So you must provide different paths for development. So I would say on a whole, uh, different agencies uh, provide support for their aid. For example, in the performing arts, we have funding for the young men and women. For the school of design, we have funding. So every young boy and girl has a different skill. So the key is that government must support all the skills across the board. But the advantage of science, because science is much more long-term education, so therefore, I have a special purpose to develop them over a longer period. So the difference from science and non-science, non-science doesn't have the long gestation period. On the issue of continuity, so when I have a chairman of ADB, my greatest response is, who will succeed me? So what I will do is that I take in young scholars, I offer scholarship in 1990. Every year I send about 30 to 40 students, engineering, science overseas and economics, so only two disciplines, they come back to work for me. The brightest one will continue. Today, the chairman of EDB was a person I recruited in 1994. 
He was a young doctor. He came in to help me in the biomedical sciences. He became a managing director of EDB. He's promoted to the chairman. And the chairman of EDB is now maybe in the early 40s. When I was chairman of EDB, I was 39 years old. Today, we are no longer young. So which means the job of my job to find my successor. And therefore, I need to have more and more talent to see who can make the great. So the key is that any good leader must worry who will succeed him or her. On the issue, what to do now for your country, I'm no position to advise you. Maybe if I come here in the next trip, I spend more time. Meanwhile, what I noticed that you are a lot of young people, a man and woman, well educated. Now, what can we do? Maybe the job is for government. How can government uh, meet them, listen to them, encourage them? Um. بحب أشكر الدكتور فيليب يو وبحب أشكركم على حضوركم لهذا اللقاء الدكتور يو كتير ركز على موضوع التعليم كتير ركز على موضوع ربط التعليم بالتنمية وتطوير رأس المال البشري أظن هدول يمكن أول إشياء لازم نركز عليهم إحنا بالأردن نيابة عنكم نحب نرجع نشكر الدكتور يو بشكركم لحضوركم شكرا جزيلا تسلم <تصفيق>